Bible or your smart device. And I want you to turn into the Old Testament with Malachi. They will be on the screen. Uh, we'll also be working on that too as far as putting our technology in here. But it, it'll be on the screen. The Old Testament, Malachi 3, 6 through 10. Malachi 3, 6 through 10. I, I want to uh, continue in our series of your guests. We're talking about the power of the plan. We are talking about finances, our stewardship through the month of January. Uh, February is coming right around the corner. We're excited about that. Uh, the series for February will be called Love Handles. And uh, we're going to have a great time with that. And, and, and man, can you just imagine have a great time with that one? But uh, we're still in the power of the plan. This Sunday, I want to talk specifically about a time. Uh, I want you to know up front before I read this whole Old Testament scripture. Uh, I believe the Bible from the beginning to the end. I believe it's all one love story. Uh, I don't think that you can take one part out in, in any place. Uh, but I also want you to know that I have prefaced every message this month, all right? We don't need your money, okay? I, we're not after your money. We're, we're, not, we're not after anything. We have no hidden agenda. We will clearly communicate. I've told everybody, especially if you're a guest for the first time, we want you to know that anytime you want one of the one of our trustees, Heather Ballard, she does our books as well. You can ask her specifically, and you can say, I, I want to see if, if what he says is true. And you can look at Sandra and myself, uh, our, our tithing report, our giving report, anytime you want. I will never ask you to do something. Spill in the toilet to giving in the kingdom. I will never ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to leave by example and do myself, okay? And so I want you to get that. You're not in some old school church. It's going to beat you over the Bible. It's going to hit you over the head and make you feel belittled if you don't tithe. All right, but tithing is a biblical principle, and it's part of the master's plan for you and I to have peace, not necessarily riches, but peace and joy and freedom in our life. And so I want to teach you on that. Every last year, my first year in existence, I told you this before, I didn't even touch on tithing, but just briefly, because I do not, because I've been the guy that made you feel like I was beating you up with the Bible. I've been that old school preacher that tithe the suit every week that just come down hard on you and make you feel guilty, and, and you can't guilt anyone into doing anything. So I want the Lord to lead you into giving, not, not because we need your money, but because there is such joy and richness and freedom in knowing that I have given what God has required of me and asked of me, and I worship Him, and sacrificially, even when it's hard, I give Him a sacrificial offering. When there seems to be nothing, I give, because when it seems to be nothing, you've got to be mindful that God has given His very best us. And so I want us to look at the Old Testament. We are looking at the prophet, one of the minor prophets, Malachi. Now, you with me? Say amen. amen. Malachi closes the Old Testament. He ends the prophetic word until John the Baptist comes on the scene. So from the time he closes the book of Malachi to we pick up in Matthew, if we just go uh, in order of our 66 books, there's 400 years of silence. Now, he's known as a minor prophet, not because of his size or the size of the book. That's really the only reason that they call a minor prophet. It's just the, the length of his book uh, or his writing there. But man, he is powerful and he's calling them into judgment. He's reminding Judah that they need to get back to the things of God. And so he does that. He really begins in chapter 1 talking about the foul offerings and giving half-hearted offerings and things of this nature. And then we move over into chapter 3 and he calls him specifically out about the tithing and giving and offering. And I want to read that to you as you read along. Verse 6, chapter 3, Malachi. I, the Lord, do not change. So that means you can't say tithing is an Old Testament philosophy, methodology. No, nope. the Lord doesn't change. Okay, so he just nails that right away. Look, I'm the Lord, I do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. James would say it this way in the New Testament. Draw nigh in the King's English. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. God's always ready for you to come home. He's always ready for the prodigal son or daughter to come home. He's always gracious. That's why he doesn't destroy us. He, he can in an instant say, and we're done. If it was about heaven, 
Now, we read here, this is the NIV's translation uh, from the, uh, uh, the Greek, uh, the Hebrew here, excuse me, the Old Testament. Most of you, the King James, uses the word robber. I want you to understand that, that uh, and yes, I've preached this sermon before at Corinth Baptist in Westminster, South Carolina, and called everybody God robbers. I want you to understand, I've done my homework, all right, and I'm trying to flaunt my education because it means nothing in the kingdom as far as the ability to speak on his behalf. But I do understand that the Hebrew word does not necessarily mean rob like you would think of thief. It, it is a better translation to say that you cheat God. You're cheating him. And see, what we, we lose sight of is as if we cheat God, watch this, who are we really cheating? Ourselves. Now, stay with me when we interact here. So we cheat God. It's not, that, it's not necessarily that we, you, you're, you're robbing God. But see, God doesn't need, really, he doesn't even need us. See, in his, his matchless grace, he chooses to use us. He could use anything. You know what I'm saying? That's God. He made it all. He can do anything at any time he wants to do. You cannot take that sovereignty away from him because that's who he is. But in his grace, in his grace, he allows us a bunch of abilities and opportunities. And so he is saying this, don't cheat me. And don't cheat me because I don't want to cheat you. But the more you put in, the more you want to get back. And that's how it works in the kingdom. And, and I want to give you just a, uh, several several different things um, in the area of, of the tithe. Let's talk about money in specific. Remember that money in itself is not what? It's not evil. Money in itself is not evil. What you do with that money, that's where the evil takes place. Because I'm not suggesting to you that you're, most of you know I work two jobs. Uh, you know, I, I, and I enjoy it. I, I really, really just work for the Lord. Uh, I help heat some, cut trees down. He really uses me like a burrow. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And uh, really a borrowed burrow. That's just the way it is. And, and uh, I've come to a place in my life that I never thought that I enjoyed being a chainsaw and running that chainsaw. I, I, I just really do. I love pastoring you, and, and I kind of work on my schedule, which is God's time for me. And uh, it's been a blessing. And I wouldn't change that for anything in the world. I wouldn't change that for anything in the world. But I use the money to further God's kingdom. It's not because I'm chasing more money. And, I, and this is a, a message a week or two back. You got to be careful that you don't get deceived that that overtime, all right, sometimes we begin to worship the money. And that overtime that we all like to work and get, and we're not careful, we'll base our income off of. Once it's gone, we're devastated and don't know what we're going to do. It's because we've allowed ourselves to get into this trap that it's not now. Now it's not just the money goes to help us. It's we begin to love that extra money and we've adjusted our lifestyle for that. So we're very careful to understand there's nothing wrong with having nice things. Nothing wrong with having money. It's what we do with that money that's important. Remember the, the title, the power of a plan. So you got to understand his plan in order to bless you. And he says, his word, he's got more than you'll ever know what to do with. Now, I think that's pretty cool. I think that, that we cheat God, and we've not seen him do his very best yet because we think we're holding back to, to increase ourselves, and the whole time, we're taking away. And so let's, let's move very quickly through some thoughts uh, this morning. I, I want to talk to you about having some risky assumptions about the time. Risky assumption. It, it's, it's very risky to assume things, right? Uh, I'll tell you, I, can, I, I, make, I make tremendous mistakes, and it costs me dearly when I assume things, okay? So there's a couple areas about finances tithing, and especially with the money, if we're not careful, that will cost us. First of all, it's risky to assume that money will bring satisfaction. Money will bring satisfaction. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, and I'm going to give you a lot of verses this morning, so I want you to listen and close. He who loves silver will not be satisfied, nor he who loves abundance with increase. I've said this a million times. Ask this question to anybody. What's enough? Just a little bit more. What's enough? Just a little bit more. 
I've got an increase in faith. And I don't know if it's happening, but this is what's crazy for. I can't figure it out, but I'd get that increase and we would do the numbers and it looks like we're going to have this, this extra at the end of the month, but where did it go? That it happen to you? Yeah, yeah. Or pay something off and think, well, I'm going to have this extra. Where does it go? It's because you can't find security and satisfaction in the things of this world in general, but specifically in money. It is here one moment, you go to the next. I mean, it'll, it'll fly away, especially if you've got kids. It'll fly away. Mom and dad say amen. And both of your kids are going to sit by, especially teenagers. Huh? It is gone. Some of you, if they're 20 or 30, they still do that, man. Come on now, all right? Okay, it might be mom and dad. But anyway, it's risky to assume that it will satisfy the risk security. Let, let me give you a couple more. Let, let, let's do this. Let's move on quickly. Let's have the right attitude toward money. Remember, it's not money that's evil. It's what we do with the money. So don't assume that it brings satisfaction and security. And then let's have the right attitude toward money. And then we're going to get to the meat of the message. So I'll introduce The right attitude is this. Money is a gift from God. It goes back to the first message. Money is a gift from God. Everything that you allow, whether it's a dollar, a hundred, a thousand, or ten thousand, or whatever, it is a gift from God. And I, I told you this, and I'll tell you again. If you live under the concept that, hey, I work for that money, I, I want to be very careful to remind you this morning that the air that you breathe in your lungs is given to you by the grace of God. The tilt of the, of the planet, the very axis which it sits on, you know, because if it was one degree either way, it would either burn up or it would freeze you. Do your homework, okay? The very axis that, that, that makes gravity a thing, that's not something you can create. We can reproduce it with some of technology, but we're not the originators of it. It is God Almighty. And so everything is a gift from God. And so to have a right attitude toward our money, all right, instead of when someone says, especially in the house of God, when it brings up the subject of tithing or money, you go, psh. Yeah, you don't remember, right? Wallet in the, in, in, in the latest period. Anyway, they ain't get mine. See, the right attitude is enough, whatever it takes. Because it's not mine anyway. That's, that's, that's the right attitude. Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. Right attitude. Money is a gift from God. Let me give you a, a second. Right attitude. Money is to be enjoyed as a gift from God. Ecclesiastes 7, 14 says, In the day of prosperity, be joyful. See, I'm not one of those preachers who's going to be like, Give it all away. Sell everything. Live like a monk in some cave somewhere. Uh-uh. I love my wife. Mm-mm. Not going to live like a monk. No cave somewhere. You know what? One of the things that we enjoy is this new 50-inch TV. Is that okay to say that? That's what I said. I enjoy it. I really do. I, 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 every time I walk by, I say, I love my TV. But my wife says, our TV. I do. I do. I love the universe. I love all the sports channels. I love that you can record it. I love having high depth. I love all those things. I'm not saying that I don't enjoy the money, but I have the right attitude about it because, see, from that flow, because I've had the little black and white one, that's all I've had. God has given me increase because I started with the right attitude and got past the risky, risky assumptions about the money, knowing that it wouldn't satisfy me and that it wouldn't bring security in my life because it'll fly away as soon as it comes in. But I'm not saying that I don't enjoy the money. So don't think for a second I'm saying that you can't have things in this world. That's a lie of hell. The Bible teaches very clearly that it is to be enjoyed, that prosperity, if you have the right attitude about it. Now, here's the main message. Let, let, let's, let's look at having the, the right attitude, not being risky and assuming things about finances, okay, or anything in this world, but let's look at some righteous action that we should take with our money. Let, let, let's do that. I normally read a bunch of statistics about the giving and how 40% and 9% and those that say they give don't really give and those that say they believe the Bible you know, I, I, I'm tired of being that kind of preacher. I want you to get it in your heart. I want you to see God. I want you to see in His Word that you can never outgive Him. That He will absolutely throw open the gates of heaven and He will pour out. Miss, Miss Hilda when I passed her card and she said, ooh, preacher after Sunday, she said, ooh, preacher. It's like God pouring down in tubs of honey. I, I mean, he would, he, would, he would open up the windows of heaven and he will rain down his blessing upon us if we have the right attitude and we use it in a righteous way, the things that he blesses with. The first one is this. This is our righteous action. Tithing, tithing. Tithing is not necessarily just an Old Testament principle. It is reiterated and commended by Jesus over in the New Testament. Just so that you know, Matthew 23, 23, Luke 18, 11, 13, and 16, there are 38 parables.
miracles. Jesus deals with you. You listen to me right up here real fast. So listen fast, baby, okay? All right? 38, 38 parables. Jesus deals with money. 288 verses of the gospel deal with money. Jesus spoke more on the top of money than he did heaven and hell combined. There's 2,000 verses on money in the Bible and only 500 on prayer and 500 on faith. Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 16 too, so don't come to me with that hogwash that is an Old Testament principle and it goes out the window that thing of tithing. It is not. It is a biblical principle from God. It is part of the master plan and there's power if we follow God's plan. You understand that? And so we have righteous actions based on it. So a tithe. What is a tithe? What is a tithe, church? So is that a trick question? Wait a minute. Is that a trick question? What? what? A tithe is 10%. It has its origin from the very beginning. In the very, in the very beginning, there is this priest, which is really, really a typology of Jesus Christ. His name is Melchizedek. If you, you're with me, follow me. In the Old Testament, and they present to him a tithe of their first fruits. Uh, you, you know, I taught you this already, but a tithe is ten percent of anything that you bring in your house. All right, anything, anything that comes your way, you, anything that comes in, and this is what I mean by first fruits. Okay, just so we set the groundwork for all the things that are going to flow in the next 30 minutes that we're together, okay? Or out, whatever God is out there. All right, tithe is 10%. It is of your first fruit. I gross here at the church. I just want to be very clear, very clear. I gross $508. I bring home $500 a week, okay? You, you with me, right? I know some of you won't. Uh, stay with me, okay? Stay with me. $580, bring home $500. I'm just going to let you in my world. I'm not going to bring anybody else in, but it's in my world. So every week, every week since I get a check every Sunday, okay, for pastor you not heads, all right? So, <laughs> so I get a check. It's 500. It's 580. It's gross. So when I tie, what am I tithing? 580. Oh, yeah, all for 580. But how much is that? $58. There we go. You got it. I know you're just getting there. I know you're getting there, John. I know it. I know it. It's $58. Okay? Now, if something comes my way and, and say, I'm, I'm blessed with $100. Let's just say, because some of you look like you're going to bless me today. And so you bless me with $100, okay? All right, you want to bless my wife. Let's be real, okay? You want to bless my wife with $100. We're going to, in turn, take $10 if we don't have the ability to give the 100 away, because it means to me, if we can give the 100 away, we will, not be super spiritual, but I'm going to at least give $10 off of that. That's the tithe, okay? That's 10%. So I, that's, and I'm just, don't think I'm beating you up, okay? Oh, my God. Here we go again. No, I'm just being real with you and teaching the Bible, and God and the Holy Ghost will do the rest, okay? That's just the way it works, okay? But I want to clearly communicate what a tithe is, and I want you to know it's not an Old Testament principle, okay? My grandmother, I'm embarrassing her right now, but she doesn't do technology, so she won't watch this or hear this, but you can tell her. My grandmother in her upper 80s, we, we, we my nanny group, all right? Like, I'm a mom, my mom's mom, and uh, we go round and round about this subject right here now, all right? Because I give her down the road, my mother got 
one of the things that they know here is, is as we set this up, that everything that's given every week, whatever that total number is, whether it's 1,500 or 2,500 or 7,000, whatever it is that's given, 10% of that is going to be automatically moved into community work. You understand me? I think that's how we're going to run the house of God. I think it'll start here. I think that's how you're going to run your home. Based on the scripture, not what Joel said. Based on the scripture, okay? And I don't mean Joel Osteen, by the way. I, I think that's how you're going to run your home, okay? I think you want to start in the house. It perpetuates the work of God. Now, it'll blow your mind to know what we do. We have, we would never embarrass anybody in this community. Never. We would never, I, I, will, I, will, I will resign and walk away from this thing, okay? We will shut the doors before we ever move to a realm where you've got a boat on paying somebody's power bill. That's really none of your business. You should trust your leaders and your trustees to make those decisions to help those people that sit right beside you in the chair that you may think they look like they're doing well because they want you to think that, but they're struggling to meet their groceries for the next week or pay the power bill or put gas in the car so they can get to the job that they're trying to earn the money to pay the bills and feed their children. I promise you, I promise you, we we'll never embarrass you, but we have helped a bunch of you and you've helped me in return. That's how we operate. We do that outside this community. You can blow your mind. You can see some of the things that we do. The shoes for Steve, all those shoes that you bring in. God bless you with a multitude of shoes, ladies and men. And we give those shoes away. We feed it to homeless. We feed it to soup kitchen. We give to FCA at the high school and the middle school. We support a church plant down in Florida. I mean, I can go on and on the things that we do to help. We're going to donate chairs to a student ministry at Senate Church of God. We're going to give to other chairs. I mean, we just all in all give, give, give. It's because when you give and you give above and beyond and the, and the tithes increase, it perpetuates the work in the kingdom. We take kids on outings. We take children on outings. We send missionaries to Africa. We do all these things. It's because you brought your tithe here first, not out there, my friend, based on the word of God. And so the tithe, a righteous act with a tithe, is because it perpetuates the program. Tithing not only will perpetuate the program of God, tithing will protect our resources. Protect our resources. We're going to write these things down. And here's the thing. Who's got, who's got, who's got the money in your pocket? You got 20 dollars, 10? Somebody got it. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Right? 
I believe we had, we had begun to do that at the, at the building we were renting. I believe we just settled in for the good. It was about full every week. And it's just good. It's, this is good. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I like it good. But let me ask you a question. If, it, if it's good here and it's great here, why would you settle for good? I want the great of God. God says, I'll fling back open the windows of heaven and I will pour so much out on you and your family that you couldn't even contain it or control it or even comprehend it in time. Why in the world would you not want the greatness of God. So when we tithe, we do by faith. We don't assume anything. We know it's a gift from God. We know that it is pointing out our priorities to God. We know that you are first in our life and you have greatness for us. And so when we tithe, when we give, it is a way of providing. It is a way of, of, of pointing out our priorities. Tithing also is a way of promoting our faith. It amazes me that I, I was guilty of this. I still struggle with it. I can trust the Lord to save my soul from eternal damnation or hell, but yet I can't trust Him with a dollar. It blows my mind. I, I don't understand the rationale of that. I do understand the crooked preachers or those guys and gals that one day will stand before the Lord and they will say, well, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we prophesy which means to preach, teach in your name? Didn't we not do all those things in your name? And He will say, depart from me for you workers of iniquity for I never knew you. I know there's preachers that have taken advantage of you. I know there's uh, biblical teachers, if you can call them that, that have used this platform for their own selfish gain. I know that. I understand that. I get that. I, I know that people take advantage of you. But you've got to get past all that. You've got to understand the grace of God is about resurrection and moving on. There is a church for you. There is a family. There is a community for you to belong in. They don't want nothing from you but to see you prosper in the Lord. They don't beat you up every week but remind you of the truth. Whether it hurts or not, that tells you that, listen, if you will give by faith, you will grow past this. You see, it's simple. Nature even screams it. Where is the fruit that the tree produces? It is out on the limb. And so you as believers, you don't think God would create that tree and put the fruit out on the limb. And you are the best of his creation, the crown of his creation, that he would lead you out on the limb so that you could produce the best fruit. You don't think he would do that. He would. And faith means that I'm willing to, to take risks. I'm willing to say, God, I know it don't feel right. I know it doesn't make sense. But I'm going to trust you. And it promotes our faith. And this is the cool thing. I've shared it from the very beginning of this month. I get all kinds of messages from you that said, I really didn't think I would have a tithe. I, I really I tithe. And God blessed me. Give me back three times that. God met this need. I went to the mailbox, had this. Now, we got a little bit bamboozled this week. We thought that they sent me a $25 refund from Verizon. Uh, she goes to put it in. It's 25 cents. It's 25 cents, though. All right? It's a blessing. It's a blessing. 25 cents more than I had. All right? So it promotes our faith. Tithing. Let me give you a few more. Tithing is a way of providing for our needs. Tithing is a way of providing for our needs. 38. It's all about 38. So not New Year's old as most of you in here. Nine. 
for your needs. Tithing, last one, tithing is a way of proving God's promises. Tithing is a way of proving God's promises. 310 tells us, prove me now, test me now, see if I'm not telling you the truth. The Bible tells us that God cannot lie. He says he will open the windows of heaven and pour out the blessings. It, 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 it literally talks about this, the, the skies opening. Tithing is a way of proving God's promises. I, I like this. You know, some of you know this. I, I listen to all kind of preaching from leadership podcasts from Andy Stanley. Uh, just, just all, all over the road. It, it all biblical based, by the way. Uh, I have my particulars. One of my favorite from years gone by is Christian T.D. Jakes. And uh, whether you love him or hate him or don't like him, don't, it really don't matter to me. Okay? <laughs> and he had a, um, I think it was back September of last year, he did a, a two-part series called Turning on the Dime. And it was about tithing. I, I, I so wanted to steal that title, turning it on the dime. I didn't want to use his, his meat unless I got moved him in the area he's pastoring. But, but turning it on the dime. Did you know that, that this proving the promise is, is literally that, that tithe? That God is saying, if you'll just be obedient, then you can, you can turn things on the dime. I, I wanted to research that colloquialism. I wanted to research that little phrase. It can be traced back all the way to the 1881 when, when a, a, a well-trained horse would turn quickly. You know, turning on the dime now is usually referred to some sports car or some ability to turn on the dime quickly, sharply, and tightly. It sometimes takes training, like I would say. Sometimes it takes special tuning. I want you to get into the vein and understand that if I give God his first, I can turn everything on the dime. You mean to tell me that my entire life can be turned on a dime and that quickly and that tightly, I guarantee you based on the principles of God, if you will be obedient, you will absolutely see the heavens open. Now watch this. In, in this. in this Old Testament setting, it is a direct reference to the New Testament when Jesus, the, the Son of God, part of the triune God, and God himself in flesh, incarnate, dwelt among us, it is a reference to when he goes to the, you with me say amen? Man, I won't waste your time. I'm going to teach you something, okay? We're not, we might not be happy to clap you this morning, but I promise I'll teach you something. And the ghost, all right? Listen, listen. He goes down in the water. He comes back up out of the water. What does the Bible tell us when he comes back out of the water? What happens? <sighs> That's what you're going. He's tricking me. That one's tricking me this morning. No, he, no, this is what happens. You're going to say, I knew it. Listen, this is what happens. He comes out of the water. He says, the voice from heaven. The Father speaks and says, this is my son in who I am well pleased. And the dove lights down on him. It's the first time really we see the triune God all in one place at one time. It is the heavens opened up. Why did the heavens open up? Because Jesus was obedient, perfect, matchless. He had nothing to do with being baptized. He had never sinned and never would sin. But the same example of obedience, he turned it on the dial and heavens opened up. Let me give you another reference. Of heaven opened up. You know, over in Acts, there's this dude named Stephen. What happened, Stephen? They stoned him to death. He's the first martyr. You remember the story in Acts? You remember that when, when Paul was holding the cloaks, we know in history now that he is there. This is probably what led to his, his conversion as he had the Damascus Road experience, as he was known as Saul there, who would be turned to Paul and write most of the New Testament, the greatest statement for the kingdom of God outside of Jesus himself. And in that moment, Stephen is stoned to death because he would not denounce Christ and he was obedient. And it literally says you'll find in no other place that the heavens opened up and at the right hand of the Father, Jesus wasn't sitting like he says that he is for us. He wasn't sitting making intercessions. But in that moment, Stephen's radical obedience caused Jesus to stand to his feet. And I can only imagine what he was saying and what he was shouting from heaven that this is mine. He belongs to me. And I will pour out blessings. You may think you're losing it here, but you've got all in the game, and the heavens will open up. And I'm telling you this morning that when you give, God gives first in your time, your talent, and your treasures, and you move past your hurts, and you move past your fear, and you get over yourself, and you get over those that have hurt you. Yes, you've been wrong. Yes, you've been taken advantage of. But when you give it to God, He will absolutely show you that He has tested, tried, and found true every time. That is a way of proving the promises of God by giving it to Him first. Tithe. You say, I didn't know that had all to do with tithing. It does. It does. He says, He will open it up and pour out His blessings upon you. Who in the world gets up in the morning and say, Not nah, I want today to suck. God, I want to be blessed. <laughs> Go ahead, God. Go on over there to them. <laughs> Not so. Not so. When you give God his first, it is a way of proof. And it can all be turned on a dime. Let me close by giving you some real application. Can I do that? Can I do that? I'm preaching better than you can beat me back. Or that was that just saying, I'm hungry, let me go. This ain't on my life. Hang on. <laughs> Righteous actions, risky assumptions, right attitude, simple little outline, easy, cheesy to remember. Let me give you 
God never anywhere in the Bible recognizes or brings any attention to the large giving. It's always the small, minor, detailed things that God brings out. Sacrifice. Strategies to give. Not only should you give in that strategy, I think another thing that you should do under your strategy is also say, Proverbs 15 11 says, He that gathereth by labor shall increase. Save. Save. Let me tell you what. I just want to give you just a real simple budget, okay? Alright? Just real simple. When you get paid, you take 10%. The very first thing. Don't, don't do the math. Don't sit down and pick your bills up. Alright? And just say, You're nuts, preacher. I am. I am. Don't figure your bills up. Just take 10% of your gross right off the top and put it to the side. If I get paid and, and, and I get the cash, I take that cash and I lose 10% and I take it, fold it, and, and stick it in the, in the inside of my wallet. All right? Take that 10%, first thing, that's your strategy, and give it. Secondly, you want to take at the least, are you listening? At the least, you want to take next. The very next thing you should do is take 5% and you want to put it in savings. I don't care if your saving is a jar buried in the backyard. I don't care what you do to save. I think you're saving. Because let me tell you something I know firsthand. Tires go flat. Cars break down. Ovens blow up. Washer and dryer will tear up. Kids get sick. Dog gets sick. Okay? And the vet, God has spent more expensive than the doctor. All right? So things happen. And so you want to be. And that wasn't a reference to killing being sick, baby. All right? <laughs> you're saving. You want to take 10%. You say, wait a minute, can I give 20%? <laughs> By all means, give 20%. Yes, we will turn it down. Okay? <laughs> can I save more than 5%? Yes, but start somewhere. You say, well, I can, I, okay, I'll give the 10%, but I, I don't know, 1%, 2%. Start somewhere. But a simple budget, easy to remember, not medically easy to equate, is to say 10% is God's first. Nothing touches that. Nothing. It goes into these buckets or wherever your regular home church is or wherever you sow into the kingdom. You want to give it there. There's a church on every corner, I know. But you want to give it to God first and bring it to his storehouse, into his house, okay? Some community, some believing body that is reaching more than you can by yourself. You want to bring your tithe in first and you should take five percent and put it aside in some kind of savings. And then thirdly, under that strategy, this is where it's going to be real, real. Okay, just get the real, real here. You want to make your payments. Romans 13, 17 says this, Render therefore to all their due tribute custom. Do it with fear, honor to whom it belongs. You know what this means? It means pay your stinking bills. I guarantee you that some of you old timers or older folks that are business owners, there was probably a generation or two back that a person could walk 
day like all of them will work out some kind of magic. Strategy.
throw that off the car lot, it depreciates immediately. It's of lesser value. The more, if you just breathe on the dog on thing, it's of lesser value. I've got to have the latest iPad. I want that thing in light. You know what I'm saying? I really want it. But as soon as I buy it, they come out one seat even lighter. But they missed. All right, the skinnier and all those things. As soon as you buy it, because you had to have it, and you're trying to keep up with the Smith and the Jones, that's no reference to the Smith and Jones over here. And you're trying to keep up with them. As soon as you buy it, it's old technology. I feel so bad for some folks that bought the car and financed it, and they got this model, and the next year they roll out the new model, new concept, and it blows that one away. The whole design looks completely different. You're like, my God, my leg is stuck with this one, all right? It, it, it. You gotta understand. You gotta understand. Status seeking spending, and this is the last one, compulsive spending. Listen to me because I'm going to give an invitation. Band, come, come on and get in place. Okay, because we're done here way over time. Way over time. Stay with me. Please, please stay with me. Compulsive spending. Go ahead, get moving in place. Stay with me. Okay, stay right here. Compulsive spending. Com compulsive spending comes from a place that there is some deep need that you need met. Everything I can research and read about this compulsive spending is it, 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 there's some kind of need. There's a void there. There's something that's lacking. And so you think that it makes you feel good to buy, to spend, to go to the golf course and use money that you have no business using because you needed to put food on your table or go somewhere because you thought you needed that. I, I want you to understand this compulsive spending. I want you to understand that it goes back to the first point. It's risky to assume that you're going to have this therapy in buying this because here's what happens. Anybody that have this happen to you, I know you guys haven't had it happen to you, but if you, you ladies have this happen to you, 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 you were feeling down, and so you, you have this retail therapy, as they call it, and some of you are going to say, oh my God, he's picking on me. I'm not. I'm just being real with you, okay? And, and you go to the store, and you, you buy, and you go down to Entourage and Clemson, and you get a little discount on it, you put it on, it looks good in the store, and you get home, and, and it causes a slap pull because when you get home, it don't look nothing like it looked on you in the store, right? You know what I'm saying? I don't know why I've had that problem. And no guy would ever admit to that. I mean, I'm just telling you, no guy would ever admit that. If you do, God bless you. <laughs> He will fling back heaven. He will pour out. 